Okay. okay. Right now you can go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks a lot, Joao, for uh, the presentation and for inviting me. Um, okay. So today, as uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, um, some work, which is actually a combination of really two work, a rather old one in collaboration with uh, uh, people at EPFL, Anton de la Puente and Sasha Moni in the EPIS Calamarica de la Tazzi. And uh, a rather recent one in collaboration with Zorko Margotsky. And this it took five years, but overall they fit nicely together. So let me get started. What is this about? Uh, yeah, of course, it goes without saying, interrupt me for any question or curiosity along the, along the way. Okay, so okay, so the, I think especially in audience like in Porto, we all know we are interested in studying, we all know that we're interested in studying quantum field theory, in particular conformal field theory. So conformal field theory is typically hard to study, as we know, because generically it's strongly coupled. But you know, there are and often we have to, you know, only we only have numerics or bound from the bootstrap or some so for or so on. But it is often the case that we can find some regimes of the spectrum of a theory, in particular conformal field theory, that are amenable to a semi-classical treatment in a perturbative expansion in some large quantum number. And uh, I think the most familiar case, the case of large angular momentum, J. This has been, I think, uh, pioneered in this nice paper by Dan Maldasen of 2007, where they realized that there was some sort of universality in the spectrum of large spin operator in CTs. And then that has been rigorously established by the papers of uh, Zohar and Sasha Zivoyedov and Fitzpatrick, Kaplan, Paul, and Simus Duffy. And recently it led to amazing developments in the, about our understanding of the analyticity structure of CFTs by Carol Newt and many others. Uh, another regime that will be relevant for today is the regime of large internal quantum numbers. This is not as rigorously established, but nonetheless, in the spirit of Alde Maldasena, there are a series of effective field theory arguments and semi classical arguments why this regime is also amenable to a semi-classical description. So you have a theory with some internal symmetry and you consider operators with large charge under the internal symmetry. And this has been pioneered by Helen and Randall F. 2015. And see there's also this paper by EPFL people that be, I think it's very relevant for my presentation today. And uh, finally, there is I, maybe the one which uh, is kind of less studied. Well, maybe it's the most studied in some sense, this is a regime of large scale in dimension delta. So this means large energy. And this is something that we care a lot, especially in the SCFT, where we know that large energy states map to black holes. And we kind of have some sort of semi-classical arguments there, but uh, yeah, mostly based on thermodynamics and hydrodynamics. But this won't be too relevant for today. So why should we, why is this at all possible? Well, the basic idea is that you know, we are interested in study spectrum of operators in a CFT because that's the observable or the simplest observable. And we know that there is a state operator maps that maps local operators to states for the theory quantized on the cylinder, R times the sphere. Okay. And it is often the case that we can find a useful semi-classical description for this state. A uh, simplest example is the large spin Aldaimal Dacena operator. So they consider operator the form phi, many derivatives phi, and the number of derivatives essentially counts the spin in the simplest case. Uh, on the cylinder, this maps to two particles spinning at antipodal points. Um, and these two particles, because, okay, it's not obvious, but they will interact very weakly. The see, quickest way to think of this is to go into the bulk. So imagine this here is some uh, ADS dual. Then the large angular momentum will project these two particles very close to the boundary. And as we know, ADS acts like a bot. So, so if you're very close to the boundary, interactions are Yukawa-like, they're exponentially suppressed. And this Yukawa and this Yuka separation, you can compute. It's just a simple exercise in classical dynamics to see that the separation goes like the logarithm of the angular momentum in the S. So the, the farther they are, they are larger the angular momentum, the closer they are to the boundary. And therefore, the energy is the energy of the two free particles, which is the angular momentum contribution, twice the mass plus some, some a coefficient, which is calculable, divided by j to some power. And uh, this power turns out to be the twist of the exchange operator in their OP of these two, of these two guys. So the minimal twist in particular. 
And this result has been rigorously established by analytic bootstrap techniques, as I was mentioning earlier. So today, I wanna build on these ideas of universality. I wanna ask a very concrete question for the sake of concreteness. I wanna ask it, this question a very um, concrete model. So we'll focus on the O2 conformal field theory in three dimensions. So I think you all know, this is the critical point of the U1 landau ginzburg theory. So this is the landau ginzburg theory and I tune schematically the mass term to zero which so that I am exactly the second or the phase transition point in the infrared, this flows to the C to a CFT. Of course, this is just schematic, this, this, this action, but I think we all know, understand what this means. And a natural question to ask is what's the lowest then, what is the lowest dimension operator at a given charge Q and spin J? Or more precisely, what's the scale dimension of this operator? In statistical mechanics language, this amounts to asking the, some, about some critical exponents that break the symmetries, uh, space time and internal symmetry in a different way. And um, so this, is, this will be the question. So I call this operator OQJ and I'll ask about this scale dimension. So for small quantum number, this is a very hard question, but remarkably, we know a lot from the numerical bootstrap mostly. And I think the status of the art uh, on this problem for this theory is this nice paper of 2019. Um, yeah, I think I can refer to that. Today, I wanna go aw away from the regime of order one quantum numbers and use semi classics in the regime of large charge and large angular moment. So what do we know? Okay. What do we know without uh, calculations? Okay, so at fixed num fixed Q, so Q is the charge. So oper operator phi schematic in this O2 CFT carries charge one. So fixed Q means a Q insertion of phi. In large angular momentum, we can, okay, I don't think it has ever been established rigorously by the bootstrap, but we all believe essentially by iteration of the analytic bootstrap argument or by EFT, that there will be multi-trace operator of the form many derivatives phi, many derivatives phi, and so forth, so on. And these derivatives essentially act like separating all this phi, pretty much like in the double trace case. So we should expect this operator to behave like Q free particles separated with separated by some large distance, again in the DS dual. And therefore the energy will be the free energy. So the angular momentum and Q times the masses of this particle. Okay, so this we should expect in the in street infinite J limit and Q fixed, but we can also ask about the large charge limit and J order one. And uh, this I will review, but let me say for a moment that this has been, uh, I think by now established, maybe not rigorously, but by FT and it has been matched to Monte Carlo as well. So we know it's true. The operator now will look schematic, something like phi to the Q. So you essentially you're putting Q bosons at a point and uh, the idea is that when you put many particles in a bosonic theory uh, close together, they will condense and form a bose einstein condensate or a superfluid, as I will review. And in this case, the energy actually, you know, this is a condensate, so the energy is very different from the case of Q-separated particles, because now it's a coherent state. And essentially on simple dimensional analysis, you can conclude that the energy will go like Q to the three half with a coefficient that is not fixed a priori. So obviously there is some gap between this formula here and this formula here. They look very different. So this makes it theoretically interesting at the very least to ask, how do you fill the gap between these two formulas? And this will be, as I said, the talk of today. And the idea I think I can say it immediately is that um, you know you have a superfluid on the one side, you have spinning party on the other side. So the idea is that you start spinning the superfluid. And uh, as I will review, and as I guess we studied in your undergrads, when you start spinning a condensate, you form vortices and a uh, number of interesting configurations will appear. And eventually this will allow us to essentially fill this gap. Okay, so this is it for the introduction. Are there questions now? We have a question here. Does that alpha depend on phi or delta phi? What? That's the, sorry, you... Maybe I can ask the question. Yeah. Uh, does alpha depend on delta phi or phi in some way or? Um, 
alpha does that i don't think there, we know a way to compute alpha uh, for uh we don't know a way to compute alpha we can only do monte carlo and fit it's theory mm -hmm. dependent if this is the question but we don't know how to relate it to microscopic safety data i think that's an open question okay thanks okay so thanks for the question yeah it's a very good question uh, yeah maybe another one Mm -hmm. So, uh, for this type twist of well, for, for Q, uh, fix and watch, there are many operators for, for each thing, right? So, there are many families. So, do they expect that this behavior of um, the dimension is the same for all the families or, or not? So, it's true that. No. I don't hear too well. I think it's true that there are many operators like this. All of them, they will have energy like this. And there will be a small correction that lift the degeneracy. Oh, okay, yeah, that, that, that energy is, okay, okay. So yeah, you know, like you can- Okay, yeah, that's all from the national house. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I understand why. So like, it's true there is a degeneracy here. I'll comment more on this later because you can move derivatives uh, essentially from one to the other. Um, we do not know, I think, in this regime how to compute this. Well, I think we know how to compute these corrections in some way, but not from the bootstrap. Um, yeah, and it's a true fact. There is a degeneracy. So that's something that we need to explain as well, right? Yeah, yeah, it was was my confusion. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. I understood it. Uh, should, should I go? Sorry, I, I, I don't hear too well when it comes from the back. Okay, then I think Vasco was saying that he understands now. Uh, it was just a confusion. Okay, I okay. Think you, you answered the question. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, but okay, this this point will come back later. I think this, these are all good points. So, okay, so let me just, so the rest of my talk will be some new results. So I'll start reviewing the, the superfluid EFT, and then I'll build up the spins essentially progressively. Okay, so let me start with superfluid EFT of large charge operator. So, um, some of you, I think I spoke about this at the journal club one year ago. My, some of you may remember or you've heard from Zohar. So, anyhow, so let me just start. So, the idea is to consider a spin zero state with charge Q. We expect this to be the lowest dimensional state with charge Q just because by state of your correspondence, you expect to have an homogeneous state as a ground state at sufficiently large charge, at least. So, and this is definitely true in the O2 model. So, I will call this state Q. So what are the properties of this state? So an obvious property, this state has charge density, which is Q over R square, where R is the radius of the cylinder. And this defines a mass scale. So generically, we put the radius of the cylinder in safety to one, but here it's useful to keep it for dimension analysis. And you see immediately why, because this charge density defines a mass scale mu square, which is much larger than the one, one over the volume, or if you want mu is much larger than one over R. So there are two generic scale, Two natural scale. One is the one associated with charge density. One is the one associated with geometry. And one is much, and you know, mu is much larger than the other. Whenever you have scale separation, you should expect some kind of effective filter description. And since this is uh, a not Lorentz invariant state because it has charge, charge density, this will be a condensed matter FT description. Which one? Um, Okay, so if you look at, okay, so you can motivate it in many ways, but I'd just like to motivate it very simply in this case, like if you look what happens at zero temperature materials, unless there is an experimentalist tuning some parameter to some critical point, generically materials go to one of these two phases, either Fermi surfaces, either superfluids. And feel theoretically, you can distinguish these two phases very nicely because you have a U1 symmetry and one breaks spontaneously U1 symmetry, the other one doesn't. Now, not only the other one doesn't, but the Fermi surface, of course, is a fermionic uh, state. So this is essentially a state where you build up fermion 
uh, and occupy all the shells. Of course, here I'm dealing about uh, with a uh, scalar theory, uh, so it's not fermionic. So I think essentially, since to get convinced, the only possibility is to have a superfluid. Um, and you can actually justify this if you study this theory in the epsilon expansion or at large n. So there is a way to kind of check that this is the right expectation for this theory coupled to chemical potential. But okay, in the strongly coupled case, we just assume this is like that. Okay, so what is the definition of a superfluid if you are a field theorist, as we are? So, well, you have to, again, the right way is thinking about the symmetry breaking pattern. But essentially, the important part of the symmetry breaking pattern is that you have the Hamiltonian and the U1 symmetry, and they are broken in such a way that there is a linear combination of the two, which is unbroken. So the Hamiltonian, I, remem I remind you, the Hamiltonian on the, on the cylinder is just the dilation operator divided by the radius. So Hamiltonian, the same thing of scaling dimension. So what does this mean? Well, it means that you break a U1 symmetry, so you will have a, U, a Goldstone boson, but this Goldstone boson is expanded around the background, which is not zero, as we typically do in relativistic effective field theory, but it's going to be mu t plus some fluctuation. So, and this mu t is precisely because if you make a shift of chi and a shift of time, the two can compensate each other if you do it with the right coefficient. So this is the meaning of this unbroken generator. So, okay, so you can, yeah. Essentially, you can think of mu as a chemical potential. Now, in this setup, you have a large scale mu. So all states which are not massless in the infinite volume limit naturally, so all states which are not Goldstone states, should be gapped in the simplest scenario at the largest possible scale, which is mu. So the radial modes essentially should be gapped by the chemical potential. Of course, there are exceptions to this expectation, but they are typically associated with extra symmetry. So if you study, Superfluids in super conformal field theories, there are modules. So there are, yeah, essentially you have to supersymmetrize the Goldstone mode and then you find more light states. But in this theory, again, this is not important. And okay, so when you have radial modes which are gapped, you have a light mode which is a Goldstone mode, you can write systematically a Lagrange in a derivative expansion, D over mu. And this derivative expansion translates into energy divided square root of q, essentially, because mu goes like square root of q. And this is the idea of the large charge expansion. So how does this work? In practice, you write an action. The action looks like this. It looks ugly, but you have to remember, so the action starts with this decay cube. This power is essentially fixed by conformal invariance. So it's essentially chi is dimensionless, and you are in 3D, so the action should have dimension free. You don't have massive parameter at your disposal. So you need to put three derivatives. It looks ugly, but you should remember that chi is expanded around a, a non-trivial background, mu t plus pi. So this dk cube, when you expand it, will be something like mu q plus mu square pi dot plus dot, dot, dot. So it's actually analytic for a large mu. So it's not an ugly action and so forth on the other terms. And if you translate mu to q, you can associate uh, schematically say the leading order term scales like q to the three half, sub leading q to the one half, and so forth, so on. So this is, uh, now you have a effective field theory and derivative expansion, as long as you care about states which are parametrically smaller than the cutoff, cutoff being mu. And in particular, you can compute, simplest thing to compute is the energy of the ground state, which translates basically to correspondent to a scaling dimension of the lowest dimensional operator, which are Q. And this is the result. If you have some Q to the three half plus Q to the one half, this comes, you know, associated essentially with this Wilson coefficient and this Wilson coefficient. So this alpha and beta are related to this C's. Now, there are one loop corrections. One loop corrections are essentially suppressed by Q to the three half and uh, two loop by Q cube and so forth. And they turn out to be universal. And uh, it's easy to understand why they're universal because if you accept that one loop correction scale like Q to the zero, there is no operator in this scaling that in this EFT that can renormalize them because no operator scales like Q to the zero. So whenever this happens, this uh, means when a loop correction, the proper scheme should be finite and calculable. So it's like a Casimir energy, like the one of the string theory. You can just compute it. And this is the number to the first few digits. It's not a rational number and smaller correction. 
Okay, so this is how you get this. You can do more, of course. You can uh, expand into fluctuation. So this is all like you're studying a fit theory, but again, the, what's interesting is that uh, you get uh, non trivial prediction. So this is the action for the fluctuation. It has a speed of sound. It's a phonon, it's non relativistic because I'm expanding on the non relativistic background. So the speed of sound is one over square root of two rather than one. And this is the energy of the phone. So this JJ plus one is just because I'm on the sphere. So I don't have K square of JJ plus one divided by two R square. So this means that uh, this makes prediction for the spectrum that now there will be operator with K dimension delta zero as I showed before, plus the energy of this Fox states depending on the occupation number MJ. Importantly, you notice that this omega J is equal to one for spin one. So these are the standards, of course, and you can confirm this by studying the algebra of the conformal generators. And operators with J larger than one are instead new primaries that we can study, you know, that are whose energy is predicted by this formula and this formula. So we get, of course, some information about the spectrum, not only a single state, just by expanding around the back. Okay, so is there a question? No. Okay. Okay, so now I want to build up spin. So I want to add spin. And of course, the natural thing will be to start uh, considering states which are phonons. So as you, in a true superfluid, this pi would be a phonon field on top of the ground state. Okay, so let me start adding spin on the to the superfluid. So let me consider an operator of QJ with J larger than zero. And let me look at phonon states with, say, large angular momentum. You have two ways to build such a state within the superfluid EFT naively. One is a single phone with pin j. And this will be the gap. It's like goes like j over square root of two to this square root. This is the form I showed before, slightly mustache. The other way is to add n phonons with pin j over n. And this is the formula. Now, if you compare these two formula, you conclude immediately that the single phonon is smaller energy than n phonons because of this one and n in the square root. Uh, however, you should remind, remember the trial in FT, and of course, the uh, inhomogeneity of the angular momentum cannot reach the cutoff scale. So J should always be larger than square root of Q, smaller than square root of Q here. For N phonons, the situation is slightly better because you want the energy of the individual phonons to be smaller than the cutoff, but you can sprinkle over the phonons, all the phonons over the sphere intuitively. So essentially, if you take into account this, you get that this formula seems reliable in a regime which goes up to Q to the three R. So now, so you might say, okay, so this is my prediction for the energy of two Q to a three half, alpha Q to a three half plus J divided by square root of two. But of course, that's something, you know, that sounds weird because at some point it's not like you lose control over some class of these states, really. So, you know, it, it seems it's a bit unwarranted to uh, trust this formula too much beyond J square root or the square root of Q. But not only that, I think more we know what happens when we put superfluids and we make them spin in some trap. So this is a different problem when I'm studying. I'm studying from the superfluid on the sphere, but it shares some similarity with experiments of bosons and condensate in a trap. Also there you have some coherent state and also there you don't have curvature, but you have a trap which localizes the superfluid. So the two things are analogous in some sense. And when you make it spin, okay, at some, you first have the, some phonons and then at some point you have this, uh, holes, which are nothing but superfluid, but vortices that form. So the superfluid spins, and uh, there are some points in which the superfluid density drops to zero, and there is vorticity around it. So the superfluid is spinning like this, if you want here. So these are not pokeball. These are just uh, vortices, but it's a very cool picture. And at some point, um, you know, at some point the vortices are that so many that they are arranged in a regular structure. So you see here there is a triangular structure which emerges, and so forth. So, on. so in other words, they form a lattice at some point. So the question is, could it be that something like this happens also for the relativistic superfluid we are studying? So, and the answer is yes. But to see this, I need to introduce some technology. So first of all, 
I'm studying a theory for shift invariant scale. So, so for, and for the mo and from now on, I'll focus only on the leading order predictions or keep only the leading order action. Now, I think you all know, or you can believe, uh, shift invariant scale in two plus one is dual to a gauge field, two plus one. Essentially because the, there is both have a single propagating degree of freedom. And uh, this is how the duality works. The coefficient C and kappa, you can compute the relation, but uh, essentially you match the currents on the two sides. And uh, F three half, F is just F mu square root of F mu nu, F mu nu, where F mu nu is the usual uh, thing. Again, you might be worried that this is not analytic, but I'll expand around a constant magnetic field. So to see this is that you have to remember the U1 current in this side becomes the topological current on the gauge side. So the fact that you have a charge density on the scalar side means that you have a magnetic field on this side. In fact, this is exactly the magnetic field. If you want to, it's analogous to the magnetic field created by a monopole at the center of the sphere. And uh, so B, if you want, is related to Q. So the cutoff in the gauge description is given by square root of B. Now that this is not the fancy particle vortex duality we, we deal sometimes in uh, studying phases of matter. This really is an algebraic duality. You can just add a Lagrange multiplier and derive it. So it's, uh, it's really, uh, it's just a trick. I'm not relying on particle vortex duality of the landau Huggins work model or whatnot. So, okay, so the, so this is the description. We have this monopole field. So now we have to study this action in a magnetic field. And we have two add vortices. Now, something which is well known in condensed matter is that vortices are nothing but charged particles for the dual gauge field. So all I do, therefore, is writing an action for some charged particles. OK, so how does this action look? So here I have the, the term I had before. And now I have two terms for the vortices. One and two. And okay, then I will have more, but these are the leading ones in the radio expansion. The first one is the minimal coupling between the, vor the vortices, word line, and the gauge field. So there is a sum over the vortices, the charges, and this term. And the, the other one is essentially the usual uh, word action of a particle, but with a mass that is now given parametrically by square root of f. That's again, because okay, with conformal invariance, I cannot write a massive term in my FT, but I have the magnetic field. So the mass is essentially given by the magnetic field. And one way to write it covariantly is writing square root of f. But what's important is that you have a mass, which is square root of q. Now, so this is a problem of, so studying vortices in this uh, background is the problem of studying um, particles which move in a magnetic field. And I think we all study that particles, quantum particles in a magnetic field, they, have, they spin around with cyclotron frequency. Or at the quantum level, they organize in Landau levels, whose energy is B over M, which is, of course, square root of Q. So it's cut off. So you seems to face a problem if I want to study this CFT. I have a state which are the cutoff, cutoff separated by each other. But okay, there is a well-known, but okay, it's known how to deal with it. The, and the obvious thing is you only keep the first and you throw away all the ones which are excited. Technically, all you have to do therefore is to treat this term as higher derivative. Okay, so maybe it's too that much detail, but if you want this term here, looks something like x1, x, uh, well, wedge x2 dot, something like this. So this is first order in derivative. This term here is, is that x dot square, if you expand it. So the one is velocity square, the other one is linear in the velocity. And I'm just saying that I want to focus on small velocities. Quantum mechanics, this means I'm focusing on the lowest Landau level. So my FT is given only by these two terms overall, to the leading order in derivatives. And I can compute corrections. Okay, so this may be a bit technical, but the point is that eventually the problem reduces to studying motion of particles on the sphere. So it's a purely electrostatic problem because particles are slow, so the magnetic field is negligible, so it's purely electrostatic. And uh, so the electric field 
So particle moves by this equation, which is the, just the usual E equal VB that we study in uh, electrodynamics. We are uh, deep in electrodynamics. We also have the acceleration term, but as I said, the fact that I'm focusing on the lowest Landau level means that, that I'm treating that as a higher derivative. So it's slightly um, simpler. Um, then I have the Gauss law that sources the electric field, where E squared is a constant defined, which is all the square root of Q. And um, therefore, I find that the electric field is given by essentially the separation of the particle times E square and the velocity is pretty small as long as the, as the particle are separated. So D is the separation. And of course, then, then uh, since I'm on the sphere, I cannot allow for net vorticity, the sum of the all the charges should be zero. This is goes integrating those law. Uh, okay, so if even if you decouple, the important thing is that eventually you have a formula for a state with a certain number of vortices with positions R on the sphere. So R means that they have my sphere and R is the unit vector pointing from the center of the sphere to something. I have a formula for the energy and a formula for the energy momentum. The log Q comes because there is a self energy. So there is a electrostatic contribution of a particle to itself, which is divergence. You have to cut it off. So you get the log of the cutoff. And you have the log of return of the separation because it's an electrostatic problem in 2D. So the propagator in 2D of a massless carries a lot. And the angular momentum is instead given by the sum over the vorticities times the location R. So a single vortex has angular momentum QR. So you see that vortices start to be the right description for states with large angular momentum. It's Q before we are getting up to square root of Q. Okay. Um, let me just go maybe to some concrete example and maybe take, and then take questions. So eventually up to all these, the, you know, uh, words and technique and cal calculation, you get that you can study states with many vortices. And now you can ask, okay, what's the minimal uh, energy configuration at fixed J? If you think a bit about it, you want minimal amount of vortices and you want the minimal amount of vorticity to start with. So you take a vortex pair of charge one and minus one. And you study their configuration of the sphere will be this rotation here. So they are, there is the Lorentz force, which is balanced by the electrostatic uh, attraction. It's static. The angular moment is Q half times the separation of the sphere. So if you combine everything, the formula for the energy is this. Remarkably, this formula, both the leading and the subleading term, depend on a single Wilson coefficient. And that's because the minimal coupling of the vortices to the gauge field doesn't have a free parameter there. So this parameter alpha controls both the leading and the subleading term. There is a logarithmic enhancement. There are some screws of Q correction here that I'm hiding, which are subleading. And this formula also up to J equal Q. And once you get J to order the root of Q, these two vortices get very close by. And therefore, they start moving very fast because of the because E equal VB. So when the electric field becomes large, V becomes large. And you know, you exceed the regime of validity of the vortex CFT. You excite higher Landau level, and we don't know anymore. Okay, so questions so far? Okay. So I'm going to send maybe. You can also do slightly more. This is something funny if you heard about this problem of quantizing vortices on the sphere. So you have uh, the position of the vortex, as I said, in these coordinates are related to the angular momentum. In particular, each vortex location has an angular momentum JP. This is what is called the fuzzy sphere. I think some of you have heard in the, um, the GI. And therefore, the way to quantize the vortex location, it's simple. You just have to impose that the vortex positions are P satisfying algebra, which is that of the SU2. So in other words, the vortex coordinates in the lowest Landau level are non-commuting coordinates. So that's why it's called fact sphere. In practice, what it means for us is that the log of J square will be correct to a log JJ plus one if you do the algebra correctly in the form I showed before. Okay. So it's a subleading term, but it's calculable and it's actually functionally independent than others that I'm not computing. So it makes sense to put it here. Okay, so then I said before that the more you spin, the more vortices you want. So for J larger or equal than Q, 
you will have more than one vortices. And for J much charge on Q, we have many vortices. And it would be convenient to have all of them charge one. So you just minimize the energy at fixed angular momentum as a function of the distribution of vortices, they just assume continuous. And you find this formula here for rho. So on the north, in between the equator and the north pole, there is a positive charge density of vortices and vice versa in the south pole. You, you plug in the formula, you find a formula for the energy, which is this, which holds now in this regime, Q to the three half and Q. And uh, the Q to the three half, if you want, you see it immediately because the density of vortices is J over Q. And you want this to be much smaller than cutoff square root of Q again. Um, you can rather argue if you want that the velocity of the vortices become relativistic again at the end point here. J is much larger than Q just because I want to approximate the number of vortices with a continuous distribution. And this is actually as the same velocity profile of a rigid body, a rigid sphere rotating, which is the same thing which happens for the superfluid in a trap. So again, we find a qualitative matching. Okay. So now what happens as J gets to Q to three half? So when J gets to Q to three half, this term competes with this term. And so you might say, okay, that's it. When J when J becomes a further delta. You might say so when j becomes so for the delta of this q to f half, you might think that this is the regime where the analytic bootstrap start to apply. After all, the analytic bootstrap regime describes the lowest twist, delta minus j order one, you might expect. But I want to argue that this is not the case, and I'll argue in two ways. Uh, first, I'll construct an extra superfluid state which has the right properties to actually go a bit beyond q to f half. And two, I'll show you from the analytic, well, not from, from the large spin effective field theory why we should expect that to kick in um, actually not a q to three half but at q square so let me do that again so the inspiration will be coming from experiments so okay so what happens so you have this super fluid profile which is rotating on the sphere at some point they, they rotate, rotate so fast that it start rotating faster than the speed of sound of the phonons. Now, I think you have all learned, like, you know that when a particle, for instance, in a medium moves faster than the speed of light in the videos, it emits radiation. And therefore you should have, when it starts emitting radiation, you have transition to a new state, essential till the particle discharges. So the same thing should happen here. It's called super radiance, I think in more general terms. When the superfluid spins faster than the speed of sound of the phonon, you should have some radiation emitted and something crazy should happen should have some transition and you should settle into a new state. So, and this actually was observed in the case of Bose-Einstein condensates in, in a unharmonic traps. At some point, this new state <laughs> in, and you have a hole in the middle. You have nothing outside, and the superfluid localizes on a strip without vortices inside. So, if you want to have a giant vortex here, it's called giant vortex, you say, but no vortices inside. And this is a picture of the actual experiment. And you see giant means 50 micrometers. So I'll let you decide if that's giant or not for you. But this giant for these people. So can we have the same thing here? So we go to study the state. Again, we look for a solution of the equation of motion. I go back to my scalar theory, in this case, because I expect to have a coherent state, not any more vortices inside. And the solution will be this. It has now mu t as before, but now L phi. So it's, it has, this is when you have something which spins phi is the angle, phi is this, oh, sorry. So I don't know. Phi is this angle here, and this is theta. So phi, when you have something goes like phi, it's a vortex. Now I'll take L phi, so it's a vortex with U vorticity, because I'll take L to be a further mu. And okay, here I think I'm set, no, not, not setting the radius to one yet. So now this, now you have to compute the charge density and the charge density look like this. Maybe this formula might look ugly, but the point is that the charge density is non-zero here, but it actually will be zero in a huge part of the sphere when L is huge. In particular, I want to look at J much larger than to the Q to the three half. And now the parametrics are very different than the superfluid state, even though I'm still using superfluid description. Before mu was always given by square root of Q. Now it will be like something like J over Q. Which is parametrically larger as root of Q because J is much larger than Q to every half. And the L over mu will be one minus something small. So this strip is very small. 
Okay, so why do so let me say some things about the fatty field theory of this state. So there are three physically distinct regions. So you can think essentially of the chi square as a master for a radial mode. Essentially, if you had a weakly coupled theory, this would be a master, the master for a radial mode. If you want, it follows by dimensional analysis. So you have a huge region, the blue region, away from the equator, where this decay square, if you plug the formula before, before it goes like L square over sine square theta. And it's negative. So the mass square is positive. So this means that you're gapping everything. You have no symmetry breaking, no radial mode, nothing. Everything is gapped here. If this L is sufficiently huge. There is a region, however, which is very small. I call the thickness delta. When instead the mass turn changes sign. And it's actually large, it's actually a screw of Q. So in this region, you may have a superfluid EFT. For this to be the case, the size of this region needs to be much larger than the inverse cutoff, which is again this M. So, okay, here maybe you cannot follow the details now because, but essentially it turns out that comparing this size to the decay, to the cutoff, you find that you have EFT as long as Q squared is much larger than J. This is not the end of the story for the EFT. Because here you have a superfluid EFT, here you have nothing. The question is, how do you go from one to the other? You need to have some boundary conditions. And so essentially what happens is that there is a small strip, the green part, where you can think of this as some boundary layer, some transition region. And again, for this, so this layer is essentially M squared is of order zero. So it's a dangerous region for the EFT. However, you can treat it within EFT as long as its size is small and replace it with some boundary conditions. And its size is small as long as this delta bar is much smaller than delta. Again, you do the exercise of computing when this happens, and you find this happens when Q squared is much larger than J, but with some weird powers. So after thinking hard and getting confused in all these parameters, eventually the point is that there is an EFT regime, which is precisely when J is much smaller than Q squared, but much larger than Q to every half. So it looks like this is the right thing to go beyond what I showed before. Okay, so the, the main reason why we're excited about this is that now you can compute the energy and you find this, the energy is equal to J plus corrections. And the fact that it's equal to J is exciting because in the limit where J is much larger than the fiat, this terrace are that approaching the linear register slope of the multi-trace operator, which is J plus something. These corrections, when J becomes a further Q square, they become a further Q, which are precisely what we expect from the red J large spin multi-trace regime. So this seems to go in the right direction. And the corrections to leading order depend, I want to stress again, on the same parameter alpha of the Q2F3R. So I'm not adding new coefficients into the game at this order. What's maybe even more interesting is that now you can compute the energy of the fluctuations. And uh, okay, so this is the quadratic action. And to leading order is a funny action. So I'm expanding a small delta. So with small delta means J much larger than Q to every half. And to leading order, the action has something like this. That's a kinetic term, which is DT plus D5. So there is no gradient in the direction DT minus D5. And okay, why some coordinates some related to the size of the strip by some redefinition, which I is technical and won't go through. The boundary condition here followed by varying this action is just Neumann to leading order. And the spectrum follows by solving this equation with Neumann boundary condition at the endpoints. Okay, now you do that. And now you clearly you see immediately if you study this equation, if you make a Fourier transform ansatz, phi equal to minus omega t to the im phi, the energy will be given by this formula here with m and n integers. M can be positive or negative, and N is always positive. So what's going on? So here in this theory, I can lower the energy because I can have states with negative M. But these states have lower angular momentum. So there is no contradiction. As long as the point is that the, my, at fixed angular momentum, I should have a unique ground state. It seems from this formula here that I can have, I can make two and three and four particle states and so forth so on, which have zero net change in angular momentum and the same energy of the graph so because I can have an M minus two and an M equal to two particle states pile up together and they will be, be degenerate. So you might be worried for EFT 
But again, I told you this lady didn't go in delta. You can restore those corrections in delta. They are again calculated, but they do not come from higher degree correction. So they are fully within control. And this correction leaves the degeneracy with a positive gap to the ground state. So you can compute also the gap between the ground state at fixed J and the first excited state. And so everything is fine, but you have an approximate degeneracy. And I think this is related to Vasco's question at the beginning. We expect this multi-trace operator to have huge degeneracy. And in this EFT, which is not yet the regular regime, but is approaching, we also find an approximate degeneracy, which matches that. Ah, oh, yeah, maybe I should mention that the fact that these are integer trading order matches the expectation of the regular regime, where you have this multi-trace state, d phi, d phi, blah, 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 and you can add derivatives, and this will increase the energy by one. You can contract them with epsilon tensor, and so forth, so on. Eventually, you can get convinced that this formula here precisely match what you would do in a what you would guess by just simply playing with derivatives on these multi-trace operators. Okay. So uh, are there questions so far? Okay, okay so... Okay, so I, I'm not sure if it's working, so I'll just click here to keep going. So I'll, uh, okay, so the final part of my talk, we'll try to go now beyond the regime J equal Q square. And it will be just comments here. It's really not uh, as systematic because it's very hard. So I said in the, before in the limit J to infinity and Q fix, we should expect this formula. And, um, so I now want to see when does this description of Q quasi free partons break down. And for consistency, it should break down with J so for the Q squared so that I can see things collapsing, it slaps into this giant vortex and superfluid and so forth. So, so this is the energy to leading order, but they didn't tell you the corrections. So again, let's think of this state. This state has Q partons, Q free particles. And they're interacting. So in the ADS dual, there are Q free particles, which are uh, log J over Q, separate, far away from the bark. So they interact through potential exchanges, again, dictated by the um, uh, minimal twist. The minimal twist in this case is given by the energy momentum tensor and the current. In ADS dual means gravity and the electromagnetic interactions. So these are charged particles in the DS dual. Now, these are Q squared part. There is each part interacts with Q particle. So, and there are Q. So eventually you get a Q square times this interaction. This interaction is dictated by this distance, which is log Q over J, log J over Q. And tau mean is equal to one because the twist of this operator is one. Into this. So this case, like Q cube over J. You can get convinced that the angular distance doesn't really play a role. It's really the fact that they're far away from the, from the bulk that gives uh, this log J over Q. So the coefficient here is calculable. It's a bit messy to compute because it's actually not purely semi-classical, but it's calculable. And um, okay. So these are the correction to this formula that we scale in this way. So when do, the, when do these this become important? Well, this become important when they compete with, the, with this term here. When I work, in other words, more physically, interaction is important where the interaction contribution per parton is larger than one. So the quasi-free dynamics also as long as V over Q is much smaller than one, which means that J should be much larger than Q squared. And this precisely matches what I found before. So, well, that's, that's good. So our picture is consistent with these arguments, which in fact are older than the superfluid ones. And uh, okay. This, to be sure that it's consistent where we need to check something else. So I want this state to plausibly collapse into a superfluid. So this means that this interaction should be attractive between these states, these partons. Okay, so this is an old question in the bootstrap. Now, in the EDS version of this question, you have, this is a gravitational attraction, which is T mu nu. So that's why I write it as a graviton propagator. And electromagnetic. So the photon. Okay, so here, okay, compute it maybe, to compute this uh, term is hard, but 
to estimate which one wins, it's enough to look at double trace operators because it's a sum of many times of the interaction between these two partners. And it's known what you have to ask there. So you have to ask about the contribution of the stress tensor exchange to the energy of this double trace plus the contribution of the current exchange. So the first one is negative, the second one is positive. And you have to ask who wins. They are both scaling the same way with J. So it's really about a coefficient. And this question can be asked within the analytic bootstrap. And it has been the formula is given in this very nice paper, of course. And it essentially depends on the scaling dimension of the operator, on the central charge of the stress tensor, the central charge of the current, so the normalization to one function of the current, and some funny screw of sticks that appears here. By the way, if you look at the weak gravity conjecture in the S, it's precisely this inequality, but with the reverse sign. So this is, in some sense, it's the opposite of the weak gravity conjecture, but this theory doesn't really have a holographic dual beyond this regime. So, of course, we don't expect problems with uh, extremal black or so, okay, you might ask what's the meaning of it. I just wanna mention because it's a nice question understanding why these two calculation gives you the same inequality in some sense. Anyhow, forgetting about that, this is what you have to check. So, and in the, actually this check box. So gravity wins over the electromagnetic repulsion. And to do this check, you have to plug numbers. I don't have any smart way to do it. And these numbers are again from this paper. In free theory, these two things are equal, and the O2 model is not free, but many quantities look like almost free. So you have to go to three digits to see that actually this is larger than this. But it turns out that it works, and actually this has been actually confirmed in some analytic bootstrap paper. So uh, it's known. But in, it makes our picture plausible that this state might collapse gravitation into a coherent state as you lower J. Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to tell you. Um, I think, so let me just summarize the results and take questions. So the bottom line of today is that I constructed some EFT for you for the lowest dimension operator fixed charge and angular momentum due to model. And as we started from superfluid plus one phonon, then we had uh, some vortex and the vortex pair, then some rigid body regular vortex distribution. Then the new thing, maybe most new thing is this giant vortex state, which is Still superfluid, what looks very different. Notice this is J, not Q2, F3 alpha anymore. And eventually we got to this multi-trace state and there is a qualitative matching between all these, all these regions and you can summarize it in this picture. So of course, as you see in this picture, there are these black lines. So there should be a transition between these spaces which we don't fully understand. And, uh, but okay, we at least have a picture for more or less how this phase diagram should look like. Um, there are some open questions. Um, one thing maybe I forgot to mention is that J and Vortex only works when J is a multiple of Q because I need, you know, otherwise there should be a new soliton which we weren't able to find. And uh, yeah, so we it would be nice to construct it explicitly. Um, there are generalization of this story. I think value evaluating theories uh, have some peculiarities. Which would, which presumably will make this story more interesting or somewhat richer. Um, there is also the super conformal field theory case, which I think would be nice exploring. I think no one looked at large angular momentum states there. It would be nice also because we know something about holographic duals and yeah. So it would be. I think this would be interesting to do. Uh, I mentioned the, the question about the transition between the various regions. So in particular, there is. Uh, I think I, during the talk, I said that at J or the Q3 half, we expect something interesting to happen. The super radiant transition from this rigid body to this uh, giant vortex. And I think it would be nice if one could say something concrete about it, even for the case of super a trap, not only for the CFT. And in general, understanding the order of the various transitions, a function of J over Q, they will tell us some information. So again, you have large quantum numbers. So you, there is a sense in which you have approximate uh, this transition, even if you're on the sphere. So, and these formulas, they might have discontinuities, this delta might have QJ might have discontinuities as J over Q changes if there is a transition. And uh, finally, uh, of course, I think it would be the most interesting, maybe it would be to study better these uh, large spin states from the viewpoint of multi of large spin. 
In particular, if one could say something concrete about this gravitational collapse I mentioned in the end from the ideas to all of the uh, of the theory. So and I think that's pretty much it. Thank you. Okay, let's start saying Gabriel. And I think there are questions. Yeah. Can I ask one question? Is the large Q expansion conversion just like large J expansion? Um we don't know. Um I think we I think we believe it's asymptotic. You should have small uh, you should have small uh, um, uh, exponential suppressed correction in Q. Essentially, uh, huh? do we see that in the numerics when you compare to this O2 model? Does it appear to give nice? So in, in the Monte Carlo case, this it seems so. I okay. So let me just go to this formula. So in So like this formula here seems to converge pretty well up to Q equal one, two in this Monte Carlo, which we don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. But I think it's related because people did study the Borel, the properties of this expansion at large n, where you can compute everything exactly. And they estimated by extrapolating large n result that the optimal truncation of this formula, when you have a very asymptotic expansion of an optical truncation, is around this order, like the first few orders. So this could be a qualitative reason why this formula, even though it's not convergent, works all the way up to k equal one, k equal two. And, uh, but I should say there is something mysterious about this. Um, yeah, there is something mysterious about the fact that this formula works so well. But yeah, I don't think, it, we know that it's not convergent in cases where we can compute everything. We know that it's not a convergent expansion. Is it convergent, for instance, for these states where J is of the order of Q? I don't think we know, but we don't know. Because you have this line in your phase diagram where uh, you could have J proportional to Q. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, 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 it's true. We, uh, I understand the question. I don't think we know. So we don't know, you know, like, yeah, I don't think we know how the how convergence property of this formula. Here at least there is something from large n. Here, as you know, there is some analytic the current what uh, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. Here we have no idea. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Uh, maybe, uh, so, like, it's not a simple question, but <laughs> maybe the answer will be, well, that you don't know, but okay, let me ask anyway. Do you have any idea of uh, going uh, beyond the semi, semi classics that you do here? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any idea of how to do this? Because you, you don't really know how the transition works, right? You don't know what to expect, but do you have any idea of, like, in, at least in some of these cases, how you could approach uh, going beyond the semi, semi classics? You, so let me see. You're asking like how to get uh, the results I showed from Bootstrap, or you're asking how to go beyond uh, the results I showed. Like well, one way was was to just pick the, the Lagrangian you have and go mm. with higher orders. But in doing some kind of Bootstrap would also be good. I don't know. So I don't know if you have any idea. Maybe it... no. I, so the point is that my take is that some of this transition will be theory dependent. I mm -hmm. think like we understand, for instance, a bit this transition due to model because we can do epsilon expansion. There is some the sum the epsilon expansion which you can do. And we understand that it's kind of a crossover where you start with one phonons, then many phonons. Eventually you have so many phonons that the state becomes semi-classical and it builds a vortex. Mm -hmm. I think people are now working also that quantitatively within the epsilon expansion nowadays. But I, I think this is theory dependent. I think like in, there are other theories where these vortices are interpreted differently. So um, here we do have some idea of what to do. I suspect again that this might, at least in the O2 model, yeah, so here it's essentially, but right, I don't have nothing more intelligent to say than taking some um, say weekly couple model in the epsilon expansion going to some semi classic regime. 
and playing with it and looking for ground states that fix J and Q. But mm -hmm. since the mode now has radial mode, you can control exactly the transition. So like you can see that this radial, if this radial mode is light here, as presumably it is, you can see it and you can still control it because you're recapping. And then, of course, once you understand the ordinary tra the transition in 3.99 dimension, you can guess this will be, you can extrapolate to three dimensions. I don't mm -hmm. think one can do much more than that, but I might be wrong. Here it might be different. The transition in the radio theory in Jam Vault, I think one can try to study in ADS. Of course, this theory is not holographic, but this analytic bootstrap is always being hinting at the holographic picture behind it. So this might be more promising. This you can just try to study some Q particles in NDS, put these potentials, and I think this could be universal. The other ones, I suspect uh, you want to take a model to study them. And bootstrap, I, I have no idea, honestly. I, uh, I'd love to say something from the bootstrap here, but I have no idea. Yeah. That would be good. very nice, actually. Okay, nice. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Gabriel once again. Thanks. And okay, thank you very much, Gabriel. Thank you guys for the invitation. Have a good day.